In our group was Jean Toll, now Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Bob Shaheen, who soon became Chairman of Judiciary Committee and then Speaker of the House. With this lucky connection, I found support for me and for my agenda, which was greatly anti-status quo for those times, including energy conservation, handgun control, reduction of nuclear waste, funding for the arts. Without this connection, I would have been in the position most women find themselves, isolated. We don't have the same built-in networks from schools and business as the men have. We have to build our own networks, which is difficult because we're so few in number, more diverse and disconnected. We have few mentors to guide us and are isolated from the power structure. Even the lobbyists treat us differently. We're less a part of the social life, often led by the lobbyists, where so many relationships are cemented and issues negotiated. Without that support system, which most men enjoy, it's hard to be an effective legislator, and it's hard to gain the power one needs to get your agenda even considered. I was unopposed for 12 years, and then the Republicans in Beaufort decided they had the numbers, and they ran a candidate. And I won, and I won the next election after that, pretty handily. And then I decided it was time to retire. Why? It was no longer fun, and it had become so much harder to get anything done. My crazy caucus friends had moved on to other things. I was disheartened by the bitter partisanship which threatened good government and turned away moderate, middle-of-the-road candidates. I was an issues person more than a party person, and I was sick of the partisan politics controlling debate and votes. I was tired of the acrimony and the mean-spiritedness. Several years after I retired, I was approached about writing a book about my experiences. I overcame my natural na laziness, and I agreed to try, because I had a message. I wanted to remind anyone who would listen that everything in our lives, from the moment we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep at night, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the roads we drive on, our schools, our environment, they're all decided by the people we elect on every level of government. So if we care about our lives, we have to care about who is elected. I felt it my mission, having been there, to implore others to get involved, pay attention, and demand better of elected officials, vote, work in campaigns, even run for office. And I wanted some of those others to be women. We need more women in political office, making decisions about women's rights, women's bodies, women's status. I wanted to tell women that if I could overcome a lack of confidence and a fear of public speaking and a dislike of confrontation, they could too. These are the roadblocks that keep many talented women from running. This was evident much to my sorrow when I tried to find a woman to run for my seat and was told by everyone I approached, oh no, I couldn't do that, I wouldn't know how. We need more women because they bring different experiences and priorities to the table, and they need to be considered and fought for when policy is being set. This is not likely to happen when less than 10% of those sitting at the table are women, and none of them in leadership, as in South Carolina. We are a prime example of the correlation between the underrepresentation of women and the status of women. We're at the bottom of both. Sadly, we used to be fourth from the bottom in numbers of women in state legislatures. Now we're at last with less than 10%. Those who say, if we don't fight for ourselves, who will are right, and the records of Congress bear this out. Most legislation in the interest of women and children, health, education, and welfare is introduced by the women of Congress. This is true on the state level also. One memory is still vivid in my mind, when so many others have faded. One day in the mid-80s, while we were working on an appropriations bill, someone put up an amendment to remove all funding for the state's commission on women. This was the same year a report came out showing South Carolina women to have the lowest ranking of all states in women's health, economic status, and legal rights. And I just happened to have a copy of that in my desk. 
I looked around to see if anyone would oppose the amendment, and when all I heard was snickering and some shouting, maybe we needed a men's commission, I ran up to the podium and waved the report around, saying in my most dramatic voice, how can you laugh and joke about removing the one agency in state government trying to help women at the very time the whole world knows our women need more help than others? There was a shock silence, because this was not my usual behavior at the podium. Or maybe they realized how gross they'd been. Without giving anyone a chance to respond, I moved to table the amendment, which went down in flames. I'm sorry to say that the funding was removed once again by veto last year. And if anyone jumped up to protest, their protest was in vain. The funding is gone. This is just one example how the climate has changed since my time there. They say that a man who runs for mayor has it in his mind that someday he'll run for president. Fewer women set such sights for many reasons. Family responsibilities, aversion to raising money, they're less ambitious, smaller egos, a fear of conflict and rejection. But I will say that those were my experiences 20, 30, 10 years ago. But in the last 10 years, there has been some change, not in South Carolina, but in, across the country. There are many more women running for and getting elected to statewide office, even the United States Senate. Um, so there is progress being made, if not here, other places. I believe that most women who run for office think more about society's future than their own, for they are the caregivers in our society. Most women are not looking for power, per se, only power to get things done. And those of us who do not aim to move up and up the ladder can be more independent. We are less beholden to a power structure which does not reward us as it rewards men and are less pressured by lobbyists. Why aren't there more Southern women in legislatures or Congress? There are external and internal reasons. Internally, the good old boy establishment neither seeks, externally, the good old boy establishment neither seeks nor attracts women, and without party support, we're at a disadvantage in the primaries, where in so many states, this is where the real battles are. Traditionalist states, such as South Carolina, are ruled by an elite which fights to keep power for themselves by excluding women and blacks and other outsiders. This is their way to resist change of the, of the status quo. The Southern concept of a woman's place doesn't fit into politics. And not just in the South, as Governor Madeleine Kunin of Vermont said after losing her first try, women have to overcome the handicap that the image of a governor or a legislator is shaped by precedence, by the pictures on the wall of the State House, all white males. The internal barriers for women, which I've referred to already, are just as daunting. Politics is a world of big egos, assertiveness, and pushiness, not natural traits of most women in our society. According to psychologist Carol Gilligan, in our society, girls were not brought up to be aggressive and competitive. Good little girls were submissive, followers, not leaders, nurturers who were meant to take care of others. These traits remain when we grow up. We don't want to risk angering anyone or being attacked or being rejected. So we don't strive for leadership or even venture into the very competitive and aggressive world of politics. Those of us who somehow wandered into politics have had to overcome all those long-held feelings, as well as the self-doubts which inhibit most women from when entering a man's world. <laughs> 